I didn't really think that I would become a doctor. I grew up thinking I would be a pianist or a writer or some combination of that or maybe have a salon in Paris. Um, a, a sort of silly dream considering I didn't speak French and I hadn't been in Paris. And I guess I'd always been interested in biology and when I was a little girl an uncle lived with us for a while while he treated veterans of World War II who had serious injuries in rehabilitation medicine and he didn't know how to talk to children so he would just talk about what he'd seen that day and I guess it made an impression and when I was at university and I decided that I really didn't want to be any of the things I mentioned before I thought what would be interesting my piano teacher said you know a lot of musicians are good at science you got good grades in science maybe you should think of medicine and then also at the time because I like challenges it was hard for young women to get into medical school and I like challenges and a couple of my friends said well getting into medical school would be hard if you did that it would be amazing and my parents said we don't care what you do but you've got to do something so I said okay medical school so it wasn't a passion that led me at that time to medical school. But was it a passion that kept you in medicine? Well, I think that growing up, um, practicing an instrument all the time, every day, whether you felt like it or not, and being very interested in biology and essentially creeping into my parents' study and taking books that they had on child development, which I assumed they had to help raising me and my sisters, um, interested me. And the more it interested me, the more I got into it. And the other thing about medicine that pulled me into it is that it deals with people. And I realized that Although I was a healthy child and teenager, there were friends who weren't, and their doctors and the nurses who cared for them were very important in their lives. And it seemed to me that medicine was a place to perhaps make a difference. And so even though I found some pre-med courses difficult, and I'd taken one a year because my piano teacher said, do it one a year and then you won't have to be one of these people who takes an extra year or two to catch up. Um, it just seemed to me that there were very interesting things to learn and the more I was in it, the more I sort of was drawn to it. And you played piano. Yes. You still play? Um, sometimes I've been what I would call a lapsed pianist. Uh, there were periods of time when my children were growing up that I accompanied children who were advanced students and at one point I really practiced for about 10 years and then I didn't until uh, about a year ago and now I'm into it. Has, in a way, teaches something that can be useful in medicine? Well, I do. I think that both medicine and music require practice, different kinds of practice to be sure, but I find that some, or I did find that some chamber music's really hard to learn and some aspects of medicine um, present challenges and I guess the approach to rising to a challenge and looking at new ways to solve things uh, was an important early lesson that um, moved on to my long time now in medicine. I, well, I agree. I think it doesn't matter what the discipline is, but being a, a good and dedicated doctor does take concentration and interest and if 
there are the patterns from early life of working hard and having a goal, it probably makes it possible to um, have that kind of self-discipline and interest to go forward and learn things. Um, I think that I liked the stories that patients had. Uh, I went to medical school in addition for another reason. I was very interested in severe psychiatric illness. Um, when I was a, a university student, I volunteered at a mental hospital ward for children. And I thought that I would become a child analyst and perhaps uh, cure one or two children every few years, and that I would be um, really tackling and helping tackling the illness and helping children who just couldn't communicate at all. I guess when I got into medical school, what I found was that the practice of psychiatry at that time was mostly um, talking and mostly it involved people who weren't really very ill, but they were like me, neurotic, and had issues. And then the other psychiatrists who were my professors at medical school, I thought, they're really not the people who are asking questions that can be solved and really help enough people. And I thought, these are not the colleagues I want for my life. And I found that um, complicated chronic illnesses and how people dealt with them psychologically and how also medically one might improve the outcome were much more compelling to me. And I liked my professors and future colleagues much more in that group. So I actually didn't plan to become pediatric nephrologist, but I sort of um, gravitated that way, and without any real planning as well. I, I like narratives. In fact, one of my um, pet peeves presently, and I don't know how much this is true in Italia, but in the US we have the electronic medical record. I'm good at computers because I do a lot of writing and editing, but the electronic medical record, though I can manipulate it, is really something that is hampering the narrative in medicine. In fact, if one doesn't like to write or think, all you have to do is assemble certain things and the machine will write a history for you and it won't have any nuance, it won't express anything of what's different from patient A with nephrotic syndrome, from patient B with nephrotic syndrome. And so I think that the stories of people who are developing and growing up as children are compelling if they're well and are compelling if they're ill, but the story and the hints contained within it often contain a germ for progress. And I think missing narrative would be a real shame. Also, I like to tell stories and write stories, and sometimes <laughs> hearing stories can be inspirational for that sidelight. But more than that, if we're talking about medicine, the stories that we can hear from our patients, or in the case of someone who's a pediatrician, one can hear from the parents or grandparents, um, will lead to a hint that may ultimately um, fuel an idea and instead of going from basic to clinical medicine, I started doing research 
the other way from the clinic back to the lab. In fact, uh, when I was in my early 40s, I had by then trained a lot of young nephrologists, both pediatric and internal medicine nephrologists, and what I began to see is after they had their clinical year or years, they went to the lab or they went and did some clinical trial and they were getting answers and I was still teaching and seeing patients and although I'd done some lab work early, I wasn't doing it then. And I thought there are a lot of questions in hypertension, an area I've been interested in, that could be answered in the lab. And so I um, wrote a lot of grants and got funding to do a sabbatical for a couple of years to learn some cell biology and applied molecular biology. And it changed my career and led me to be much happier, actually. Well, I think you're asking how, how come I've been in multiple areas. In fact, I think it's partly giving in to my personality. I think I tend to be someone interested in too many things. Um, looking back at my life, that was true when I was a child, and I kept taking up new instruments, and my parents said, oh my God, now she wants to play the cello. And I had played the violin um, for years, and I said, no, I like the sound of the cello, I'm going to learn the cello. And they said, okay, you can take cello lessons, and you can, um, if you study hard over the summer, you can probably be in the school orchestra. And we're not getting you two cellos or renting a cello for the school orchestra. You'll just have to walk with the cello to school. So I lived over a mile from the school and I was not a big kid. So I was about 12 and carrying a cello to and from my school for a year was very annoying. I kept saying, you could drive me with the cello and they said, well, no, it's what we said. You know, if you love the cello that much, you'll keep walking to school with your cello. Um, and eventually I went back to the violin. But I also tried the oboe and I tried different sports and in my undergraduate life I tried as many different crazy extracurricular activities as I could. For example, I am a terrible actress and I nonetheless went out for plays and got bit parts. And I said, well, I'm not a good actress. I guess I'll be a set designer. So I tried that. And I think in medicine, it was more focused in that, OK, I was staying in medicine. But I sort of have a tendency to distraction. I wouldn't really call it ADHD because I can concentrate but I tend to be diffuse, and I've always really admired colleagues who they went to medical school, and this is true of a few friends, they wanted to study one entity and really go deeply into it. And they were always focused on that. People who've been interested in sickle cell disease since high school and keep doing their work, people who have wanted to get the gene for autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease since they were a first year medical student. I envy them because they can keep focusing on the one thing. And in my case, I know I can't, but I'm bright enough to go deeply enough in my tendency to be diffuse to accomplish a few things. So I think it's taking what is probably a defect and saying, okay, you can use it in the best way you can. So that's how I describe myself. I'm, um, I like classical music and 
Which composers I like depends probably on what year it is, but I particularly like Brahms and Schumann and Schubert and I guess Beethoven and Bach. Um, I like some contemporary music as well, and I've lately um, tried another new thing, and that is I'm becoming a sort of music critic. I um, write <laughs> reviews of classical music and experimental music concerts for an online blog in Boston called the Boston Musical Intelligencer, and that's a lot of fun for me. I don't so much like um, popular music. I guess I like some rock and um, I actually like some hip hop when it's clever. And I'll listen to anything. I like ethnic music and I like drumming. I do like literature, but um, I have so much to read every day from my journal job at the New England Journal of Medicine that I probably don't read enough. I like American literature, and I, I guess I'll read anything when I get the chance, but I'm, again, not somebody who decided, oh, the works of Charlotte Bronte interest me and I'll just read everything she ever wrote. I'm not like that. In contrast, I have friends who read everything and um, my um, late husband liked in his retirement to read everything a given author ever wrote and discuss it, and that was very interesting, but I couldn't do that. Yes, I guess I would call my tastes like a smorgasbord. <laughs> I, I like to experience and sample things in different aspects of life and medicine, and to keep changing if I can. I, I think one of the nice things at this point in my life being some number over 70, I won't exactly specify, um, is working with a lot of young people and people from all over the world because their lives are interesting. Um, right now, I still have a consultative clinic and see children with um, general nephrology problems. And I had, when I started the New England Journal job, a pretty large panel of um, young children and teenagers with chronic kidney disease. And I've continued to follow them, although I've now been in my present position for a long time. And so a lot of those patients are adults. and. Um, some of them have said, but can't we keep seeing you? And I say, no, you're, you know, you're in your mid-twenties, or in a couple of cases, you're going to be 30 soon. I cannot responsibly see you anymore. And then some of them have come back, and this is really a nice thing, and have said, well, could you take care of my child? This is in the case of some inherited um, conditions. And I've seen some of those children, and being a medical grandmother is really fun. You know, I've known, at that point, I know the parent very well, because um, that parent may have been a former patient, and I know their parents, and sometimes I know the great-grandparents. So general pediatricians get to do this all the time, and my children, long ago, because my children are um, middle-aged and have their own children, saw my pediatrician. And that was, I think, special for him, and it was special for me. So in a way, you had a direct appraisal of the evolution of nephrology. I, I guess that's true. And I would say the other thing I do is I still do some basic research in collaboration with two groups so that I 
keep thinking about new ways to do things, and that's fun as well. But um, when I started in nephrology, the first meeting I ever went to, I think, was the second American Society of Nephrology meeting that there ever was. It was a tiny meeting. It was in Washington, in the Sheraton, Washington, um, near the zoo. And there were probably a couple of hundred people there. And it was so long ago that everybody presenting had to decide on their presentation and the slides they would use about six weeks in advance because the artists had to be hired to make lantern slides and put them between pieces of glass so they could be projected and so they would look relatively nice. And every once in a while, things would get stuck in the machine and the slide would melt. Um, and the number of people in nephrology didn't include very many people. I was a medical student at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the renal group there in pediatrics was um, large for its time uh, and mainly involved in understanding developmental physiology and renal physiology in children and some of those um, people were very active in the ISKDC, which studied nephrotic syndrome in the 1960s. So um, in the beginning, nephrology, at least in pediatrics, was not fully independent from other things. There was, for example, a renal metabolic ward, and many of the first pediatric nephrologists were endocrinologists who got interested in the kidney, which of course has a lot of endocrine things. Um, going on. If you would come back, would you start again? In nephrology? Yeah. I think if I went to medical school today, I would, for one thing, have had an easier time deciding what to do because I like taking care of children and also older children and adults. And I couldn't decide whether to take a medicine residency or a pediatric residency, and I think today I'd do med-peds. And I think today I would probably do med-peds, nephrology, and perhaps combine it with an ICU um, training as well, which is possible. But I would become a nephrologist again in a minute. Um, perhaps I would take training in um, becoming a trialist because I might have been able to do that, but um, the laboratory questions that interest me, you know, and would interest me as new ones come up probably would be there. So I think the thing about nephrology that's so nice is it's so varied and most nephrologists have a lot of um, interests and are thoughtful and tend to be bright people. I think nephrology, um, like infectious diseases, has some of the brightest doctors. So having wonderful and interesting colleagues is part of the journey that's fun. regret? Um, no regrets. Uh, I, I suppose there are things that I maybe wish I'd done, but I realize I couldn't have done them. Sometimes I think that I should have done a PhD MD instead of an MD, but at the time I was going through medical school, I didn't think that I could do basic science and you know, I'd probably be like that again. Well, I think uh, there would be several themes and I'm sure which one dominates depends on the person. 
um, I think some people in nephrology perhaps see the importance of helping someone with a chronic illness that affects um, so many aspects of life would be important and see the humanity in it. Other people see the, um, the challenge of the complexity of what the kidneys do and what happens in illness. And maybe other people see the basic questions and um, go into nephrology because of the biologic and um, physiological questions and the thought that maybe it would be an area of medicine that ultimately would allow personalized medicine to work. Um, so I don't know. I, I think um, it's a perfect field for someone like me who can't really choose one thing. <laughs> Um, well, if someone asked me what about nephrology, what I would say is it's a really varied field. And as a nephrologist, you can see patients who have really complicated life-challenging issues, or you can see people who have much less... Um, life impacting illnesses or you could see people with hypertension and you have the choice of having a very varied life as a nephrologist. I think it's also a field in which there are so many questions that if you're someone interested in learning new things and contributing them to the world, there are many possibilities. and. It's also a field where if someone's interested in world health and public health or doing drug trials, all of that's possible in nephrology. The other thing that I should have mentioned is there are quite a few nephrologists who end up doing something else essentially because the skills of being a nephrologist, which involve a lot of organization and executive skills and a lot of teaching skills because one needs to explain things to patients and often teaching nephrology to students is a challenge. It's um, a very varied organ with a lot of different concepts to put over. A lot of nephrologists have become department chairs, have become deans have gone into industry or um, have just thought of um, new ways to look at business that involves medicine. Um, and it seems there's an unusual proportion, particularly in pediatric nephrology. Many of the um, more senior pediatric nephrologists have become very successful department chairs. Yes, I guess I'm old enough so my university friends say, why are you still working? And I say, well, I'm immature and perhaps don't acknowledge how old I am, but there are so many interesting things. Um, it doesn't seem like the time to stop yet. If I were a doctor but not a nephrologist? No, if you were not a doctor and not a nephrologist. I don't know. Um, I did have a couple of ideas. Um, I, I will say I'm the oldest of three daughters and my father had hoped that I would be a son and so you know I was always told you have to do something and so I had other ideas and when I was in Firenze as a student 
um, in the summer of 1962, I fell in love with Fiesoli and with the Etruscans. So I would, after classes, go up to Fiesoli and go through the museum and go look at digs. And I wrote home that I would like to take a year off from university and be on a dig here in Fiesoli. My parents said, that's an interesting idea. If you do that, and you're welcome to, don't count on us for any support for college because we don't think that's a good fit for you and we know that you have tickets on, your, on a plane to get back to New England at the end of the summer and we expect you to be on that plane and if you're not, you're on your own. And this was 1962 and I paid attention to my parents and was an obedient eldest child so I didn't do that and I didn't become um, an archaeologist, but I was quite interested. And I, I thought of being a newspaper reporter, but even though I may not appear shy, I'm um, one of these introverts who can appear like an extrovert, and I found um, asking questions, you know, trying to go out for the student newspaper, um, asking questions when something was uncomfortable for somebody, very difficult. I just, I could do it now, but I could not have done it then. I couldn't do it then. Um, I just thought, that's private. I shouldn't ask that question to those people and then, what's more, write it up. I just couldn't do that. It seemed morally terrible. So I gave that one up. Yeah, I, I think that it's very organic and there are so many different people in nephrology. I haven't said that it seems what I, I could have said. I think some people went into nephrology maybe in the 1970s to um, make to think that maybe they could do dialysis and make money. Um, that was true for a while. I don't think many people did. But I think most people are, are drawn to something that is varied. And I think that's maybe um, somewhat unique in nephrology. I think um, friends I have who are a bit like me in, in liking many different things have often chosen um, infectious diseases because it too is so varied. I think that would be hard to say. I think the intellectual challenge probably speaks to me personally, but I think in, you know, in seeing certain children whose lives I remember very much um, and their families. It is more like a, a slow motion film or a free form poem. And some of my patients or other friends' patients have written wonderful poems um, about the process of their their health or their illness or their recovery. So I think in that way it's really um, compelling um, if not a sort of flame that draws some of us like moths to it. It's um, never boring and I, I would say my very unscientific approach to life has been that I don't get bored for long because if I am, I do something else. <laughs> yes, I, well of course I didn't name people's names as this one or that one, but um, I 
was asked to give an interview like that for pediatric nephrology because the um, ASPN interviewed some of us old folks um, because the 50th year of pediatric nephrology has been celebrated this past year. Um, I, I can send it to you, but I recently wrote up um, the compelling story of uh, a patient I was involved with when I was a medical student. Um, I wrote it up because she was a nursing student and she ended up having had a, an illegal abortion and as a result um, pelvic infection, systemic sepsis, ended up um, having to have a panhysterectomy and also had acute um, <coughs> kidney injury that ended up with cortical necrosis and she was on dialysis when I was an extern. And um, I've thought about it pretty much every week for the last more than 50 years. Um, and because of the political situation in the states right now, and the likelihood that um, someone will be going onto the Supreme Court who is anti-abortion, and the question of would Roe v. Wade, which uh, has allowed um, women to have um, abortions when they wanted to, um, or needed to, or had various compelling reasons to would be overturned and um, I just wanted to tell her story um, and I've gotten more positive feedback on that than negative although I have gotten some hate mail to the extent that when I get envelopes without a return address I'm worried something will be in it um, because the feelings are so high in the states about this, but um, I do think that there are many important stories and lessons in what we do and who are the patients who come to us and why. Um, after I wrote that little piece, one of my colleagues who's like a couple of years older than I am said, he had taken care of young women in the mid-60s in New York, where, where I was at that time, um, who were on dialysis and that of patients on acute dialysis who became chronic dialysis patients. He'd had a series of 31 patients, which was a lot at the time, um, and of those, um, more than half were from young women who'd had bungled abortions. So that's a lot. We never learn enough from the story. Uh, it's true. So thank you so much for. Oh, well, thank you for tolerating my meanderings. <laughs> I see. Okay.